Sorry for the confusion. It's like, am I next? Am I next? Well, good morning. It is so good to be here with you. Man, we've been feasting, haven't we? It's been fantastic. Hi, my name is James Chong, before I forget. My name is James Chong. I'm the National Director of Evangelism for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, and this has been so great. It's, it's my first time at Ambition, and I am just soaking it all in. Every speaker being here, it's been like being at a buffet and just gorging yourself on kingdom teaching. I was like, oh, so good. Uh, and, you know, what do you do with a talk like last night, right? <laughs> Brian was killing it. And you just have to, you hear something like that, and you just fall down, and you worship the Lord. But, Brian, I got to say, man, you know, the advice you gave to your son, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> uh, I'm just kind of saying, you know, you advising your son to go ahead and, like, start nagging on some other person's girl. You know, there's such a thing as hashtag honor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag just playing, just playing. <laughs> and then also just to hear Kathy speaking, I mean, her talk itself is an apologetic for why women should be leading and teaching in our churches. You see her and you clearly see that the gift of teaching was bestowed upon her. Right? And God, if, she, if he gives you a gift to use, shouldn't you be using it? Yeah, hashtag study the Greek. Hashtag, I wrote an article about it. You can check it out later. Uh, and I'm glad also to be here with you. I, I'm glad that Affirmative Action is working on this speaking podium. I'm so glad to be a part of that as well. Oh, that joke didn't work, huh? Okay. Now I've offended everyone. Let me just pray for us and we'll get started. Is that all right? Let me pray. Well, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here in the room. And Lord, uh, we're having a little bit of fun. Thank you that the joy of the Lord is our strength. But I also pray, God, that the things that you want to happen would happen. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray that if I say anything that is from you, you would allow that to uh, Go and break into our souls and to make us more like you so that we might bear fruit. And if I say anything that's not from you, you would keep that from our ears as far as the east is from the west so that only your word would remain. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you have your way with us? We know that you're here. Help us to be attentive to your movement and your leading, knowing that your speaking is far more important than my speaking. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, uh, I've been asked to talk about planting, witnessing communities. And I think as we've talked about planting and as we, you know, I can't wait to get back out there and to start something new, right? And you might be feeling that in deep in your bones of wanting to start something new. Just get me out there, Jesus, get me going. And I think at this point I want us to go ahead and say, hold on a second, I want you to start examining the seeds in your hand and going, am I planting the right kinds of things? You know, if you go out to plant an apple tree, you don't just grab a bunch of seeds from like uh, what's called uh, like Henry's Marketplace in our place, Sprouts. You don't just go to the grocery store and just grab a whole bunch of seeds and go, <laughs> <laughs> apples arise, you know. You actually have to go about cultivating, doing all the work, but you, you, at the very least, you're going to have to pick the right kinds of seeds and to make sure you have the right seeds in your hand before you even start to plant. And that's the, the point of this talk is to say, do you have the right seeds in your hands? And what kind of seeds do you want to proliferate? That if, if there is an orchard inside of every apple, well, I would want to know what kind of seeds you're going to be using to build that orchard. So it's with that that I want to jump in. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start back, since Brian had the, the liberty to go back in time. I'm going back in time, too. And um, about, when, ooh, it's been a long time, about 23 years ago, uh, I went to college. And uh, when I went to college, I had no intention uh, in becoming a fraternity guy. I had no intention of joining a fraternity house. 
you know, I was coming off an inner city mission for the summer. I was coming to college. I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I got into the school I wanted to get into, uh, MIT in Boston. Oh, there's MIT folks here? Wow, praise God. God is still at work. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I went to MIT and wanted to be an electrical engineer. And here's actually, you know, the altruistic dream was uh, I wanted to be, and this is an old movie. Has anyone seen Stand and Deliver? So, oh, you guys have. Um, I wanted to be Jaime Escalante. I was going to make up my little nest egg. I was going to be an engineer, have a nest egg, retire early, go back into the inner city schools of which I came from, and teach calculus. I wanted to teach math, inspire people. And so I had this, insp this dream to go to MIT and to do that. And so I went off, and as I got there, I realized my mistake in choosing this school. <laughs> because it was all of us nerds trying to start over. And so what was happening in this place was the fraternity scene was alive and well. Because all of us wanted to be cool. Just imagine Revenge of the Nerds on steroids, right? <laughs> And we all wanted to go there and restart our lives and start over. So 40% of the men were in fraternities at MIT at the time I went there. And part of that, the administration encouraged that at the time because they didn't have enough housing for all the freshmen. So we had to go. And so what would happen is you would show up on Thursday, and then you'd go through all these orientation exercises, Friday through Friday. And then Saturday, what would happen is... Um, they would take you to the main court of MIT, which is Killian Court. It's where you see the dome, if you've ever seen pictures of it. And you, they put all the freshmen in there. You're surrounded by three uh, walls, buildings on the two sides and the buildings in front of you, and the river's at your back. And you're all packed in there, and you're listening to the final speech that somebody's giving to all the freshmen, charging you to get your glorious MIT education. And then behind you, on that one open side, are fraternities and sororities completely clogging the way out. And what happens is, at the end of that speech, they say, let the rush begin. So on your third day there, all of a sudden, all these people start to come upon you like vultures seeing the carrion, and they come after you. And my intention was to slip out the side and just be in the dorm. But I was hanging out with some friends, uh, Fred and Tyrone, and they were like, hey, let's go over to this fraternity house. And I'm like, why would we go to the fraternity house? And they were saying, well, free steak and lobster. Now, you got to get this. I'm from the West Coast, Seattle, Washington. That's where I grew up. And what we have perfected, we know how to catch Dungeness crab, right? Crab is amazing, but I've never had lobster before. So when you have, like, the offer to go ahead get some lobster, I'm going to go get some lobster, right? So uh, there we go. And we head over to across the river into this beautiful located building. It's a three-story brownstone that's right off one block away from Newberry Street, which is like the Rodeo Drive of Boston, six blocks away from the Boston Commons. I mean, it's in this perfect location. And as I'm hanging out there... I am completely surprised by how cool these guys are. Um, and cool, in, what I mean by cool is not like cool. <laughs> what I mean by cool is that this was an incredibly diverse house. And everyone could do whatever they wanted. It was a, a place where we would win the Dean's Award while I was there in college every single year for matching the ethnic demographic of campus the closest out of any other fraternity house. We had six foot four, Miles McCoo, um, African American guy with hair that made him six foot seven. This was the day where kid and play was in effect. Um, <laughs> Then we had like our, our cross-country runners, all-American from Maine. And then we'd have our, our folks from, uh, uh, from Ecuador. Uh, we had just people from all over, just a super diverse house. And not only was it diverse, it was super sarcastic. Right? So it was great for me, someone to jump in in a house where everyone's just talking junk and having a fun time. And I was surprised how much I liked these guys. And all of a sudden, I'm in the swirl of rush, and I'm into it. And I'm getting into it. Um, it's there that while I was in the swirl of all of a rush and trying to figure out what to do, that I just remember um, trying to decide whether or not I should be in this fraternity house. And as I'd gotten to know all the guys, I knew that if I joined it, I would be the only Christian in this house. And I remember padding up to the roof deck, and I remember it um, raining a bit slightly. It, it almost felt romantic, you know. And I'm there up there on the roof trying to discern the will of God. And the, 
I remember the smell of the damp wood of the, of the wood roof deck. I remember looking out at the antique street lights that would line Commonwealth Avenue and how it would blur in the midst, uh, mist. And I remember just feeling like the sense and the presence of God. And he was telling me to pledge and to be a witness to the house. And it's with that that I went down and pledged to be a witness to this house. Now, it was at that point that uh, I realized even more what kind of house I was getting into. <laughs> well, there was all this diversity and all this incredible stuff about the house, which is fantastic. But it, it did have this wide range where we would have an Indian vegan who never drank a drop. And then also a guy from North Carolina who smoked so much pot in the house that his nickname was Southern Fried. <laughs> you know, like we would have these huge ranges of people where there would be like people who really tried to hold on to a particular morality, even though they weren't any kind of religious background. And then you had folks who would watch hardcore porn in the main living room where everyone had to go through. We had places where um, people who were trying to get girlfriends, and then we had others who were... Um, we basically had public showers. We had no stalls in the showers, so all the, everything was open. But on the weekends, those shower stalls would become co-ed. Right? It was this kind of house that had this huge range of different kinds of things. And I wish to say that I had as much influence on the house as it had on me that freshman year. And so as I'm there, I'm not, I'm starting, you know, I don't join a Christian fellowship. I'm, I'm doing kind of a, the whole fraternity thing. I'm, I'm going to the parties. I'm dancing on tables, swallowing live goldfish, you know, just the whole <laughs> kind of craziness of it. And I started dating a sorority woman, uh, you know, who, who didn't know Jesus. And uh, my life started to become this double life. Well, it was at that point that my sophomore year that uh, I started to come back to faith, and that's a, a bit of a longer story. But God grabbed a hold of me. In a varsity was a huge part of bringing me back to Jesus, and I started to come back and started to figure, get my life together. And I remember... At that point, my sophomore year, I was starting to hang out with the fellowship, and uh, I was, we were watching a video uh, that Paul Tokanaga had on Urbana from a long time ago. And I remember feeling convicted about needing to reach out to my house again. And there was this call on my life to do that from way back, and I was remembering. And I was trying to go, should I do this or should I leave the house? Because the house clearly wasn't a great effect on me, so should I leave it or should I stay? And deep in that, I was wrestling, wrestling, wrestling on whether or not I should go back. But after watching that video, I felt like the Lord was calling me back. Now, imagine the scene here. God was calling me to be a witness, to be a witness in a place where there were no Christians, in a place where clearly I wasn't an exemplary a uh, picture of what a Christian person should be like. The brothers knew exactly what I was doing. Not only that, I was a terrible pledge. <laughs> I mean, uh, I was so bad, actually, and so willful and so rebellious against the system of this fraternity house. Like, I, was, I considered myself such an iconoclast. I wouldn't conform to this frat house. So I, I would be such a punk in this house that they would normally initiate people in alphabetical order. But just to make the point that I barely squeaked by into the brotherhood, I got initiated last. I was such a bad pledge. On top of that, you have to remember that we're at MIT, so if you want to be a witness there, these folks are freakishly brilliant. I mean, these guys could do almost anything, and so if I came in there talking about Jesus, I was going to get ripped apart to shreds. My life wasn't together. My, everything that I was doing, there was nothing about me that could be a great witness, and on top of that... I was going into a very hostile place, a desolate place where nothing of faith could grow, at least so I thought. And it's with that that I want to talk about, uh, open up the scriptures, because Jesus is this incredible planter. And when we look at the ways that he planted a community, particularly in John chapter 4, we'll see the ways that he'll enter into a desolate place, a place where they didn't think, at least in Israel, true religion can flourish, true faith could flourish. But you'll see what Jesus does in that 
And then we'll, we'll take that out and see if that can help us examine the kinds of seeds we've got. Sound all right? So go ahead. If you've got your Bible, open it up to John chapter 4. <laughs> or I guess in this day, turn on your phone, open up your Bible app, go to John chapter 4. Google John chapter 4. That'll get you there too. We're going to look at John chapter 4, the first 10 verses, and then we'll skip later on into the verse 27 to 38. Um, John chapter 4, verse 1. And this is Jesus as he's entering in. So now, uh, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, which is a fascinating. Let me just pause right there. So that is interesting because the text tells us that he has to go through Samaria. Uh, Judea is down um, in the south. When it gets to Galilee, it's up here in the north. Samaria is in the middle, but actually most holy people decided to take the route around to the west. Uh, They felt that if they went through the Samaritan land, that somehow they would be defiled. But the text tells us that he had to go through Samaria. And the question is, why did he have to go through Samaria? So then, we'll just have that question. We'll keep going. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. All right, so not only does he have to go through Samaria, uh, even though most people did it. And, oh, sorry. And the reason why people didn't go through Samaria was because the Israelites hated Samaritans. Samaritans were, in their minds, considered half-breeds. They were half Assyrian, half Jewish people. And they reminded the Jewish people of the northern folks who rebelled against God and were not, did not stay faithful to God. And so they were allowed to be conquered by this foreign invading uh, empire, and they intermingled with the people. So the Samaritans, not only did they hate them for racial reasons, but they also had all this theological and historical reasons to be at enmity with these people. So they didn't want to go through there because they didn't want to touch Samaritans with a 10-foot pole. So there was ethnic tension there. He goes through, he has to go through, he comes to a town in Samaria near Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Jacob, and hangs out in a place of contested, well, a place of contested worship. It would be in the shadows of Mount Gerizim where the Samaritans were worship, and the Jewish people would say, that's not where you worship, and you'll see that play out in the passage later on. But also he chooses a spot where there's joint ancestry between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. And that's odd. Why would he do that? Now, while he was there, the text in verse 6 tells us that he also was there um, about noon. With us. And so he was sitting down, tired from the journey, and he wouldn't expect anyone to be there. Most people drew their water either early in the morning or late at night to avoid the heat of the day. So now, in verse 7, when a Samaritan woman is going to start to come to him, it's going to be a very odd thing, because she shouldn't be there, actually. So verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And then Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. There's a whole bunch of things happening here, right? Why is this woman here at noon, right? She shouldn't be here. Why is she there all alone? She must be some sort of social outcast, which they'll also later find out. Um, And then he starts a conversation with her, which no holy person, no professional clergy person would ever do in this Jewish time. It was considered immodest to talk to someone of another gender in public, outside of your own family. And for you to do that, it was scandalous. It would be like flirting, it would be today, with someone else's girl. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Sorry, we get back to that? So it was really considered immodest. It was considered not the thing to do. You did not do that. And there was a defining barrier for men to talk to women. It was not allowed. And here Jesus is doing that. 
And then Jesus says, will you give me a drink? Asking her for water. And she gets this. She's like, whoa, wait a second. You're Jewish. I'm Samaritan. This conversation should not be happening. And I'm a woman. We shouldn't be talking. And then Jesus says this crazy cryptic thing. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. What? Right? It's almost like he went Yoda on her, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm, if you knew the gift of God. You know, it's like, what? Uh, this weird conversation. Why does he do all these things? And as the conversation begins to unfold, we're going to find out that she has lived a life uh, that hasn't been up to the moral code of the day and has, in fact, had five husbands. And whether or not those are actual husbands or men that she, she has just slept with and Jesus is calling her husbands, um, these are the things that will start to come out in the light of this conversation. And they will start talking about the things that matter, the things that are important, the things that are core to who they are and who, the, who, who he is. And ultimately, she'll start to see that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the deliverer. Now, my question it goes back to that first question I posed. Why does he have to go through Samaria? And we could just keep adding all those questions on top of each other. Right? Why does he have to go to Samaria? Why does he have to go to a place of common ancestry between Jews and Samaritans? Why does he then start a conversation with a person of a different ethnic background and a gender that he's not supposed to talk to? And why does he then start this crazy conversation just with this almost enigmatic statement, but clearly it drew her curiosity? Why does he go through each of these steps? What is going on and Jesus to make him do these things? Well, one thing we know, he's being super intentional, right? And in his intentionality, I believe, He's trying to prove his love. Now, what I want us to talk about is that when we think about planting in our communities, can we keep on being intentional ourselves to connect with those who are skeptics, cynics, and seekers, in his, uh, skeptics and seekers to Jesus? Are the ways that we can keep being at the forefront intentional as we plant to make sure that the DNA of our seeds continues to point toward those who don't know Jesus, so that they might have a chance to get to know him. And can we be intentional to do that because we love them? Now, when I use the word intentional, that's going to bring up some heebie-jeebies for a lot of folks, right? Because intentionality doesn't feel like, uh, it doesn't feel good. It, does, it feels fake. It feels forced. It feels like a script. It feels like some propaganda. It just feels like something that doesn't feel authentic or right. Like, can't we just be organic here? Can't we just be a little relational? Can't we just go with the flow? Can't I just, for the charismatics in here, can't I just follow the spirit? <laughs> can't we just do this on the way? Why do you have to be intentional? Why do I got to plan about it? Why do I got to think about it? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to think about it and pray about it ahead of time? Well, um, maybe to help illustrate that, let me tell you a story um, about my first Christmas as a married person. Uh, I, was, uh, I can remember when I was married because it's easy. I was married in the year 2000, so I always know exactly how many years it's been <laughs> since I've been married. That's good. That's really helpful for a guy. Now, uh, it was the year 2000, Christmas, and it was also an Urbana year that year. And my wife, her family lives near Los Angeles. Uh, my family was in Seattle, but we knew that it would be impossible for us to fly home and then to fly to Urbana uh, bef before, uh, for Christmas. So it would be the, f the first Christmas uh, for either of us away from our families. Um, where actually, the, well, it wasn't. It was one of the first Christmas. We actually had one right before that. Um, but it was a time where we really wanted to be with our family as a married, a married couple, but we just couldn't make it back. So I was like, how can I make Christmas special for my wife? What could I do? And I scoured the internet, which was super slow at the time, and figured out <laughs> something, and I had this plan concocted. And then on Christmas Eve, the 24th, I said, honey, pack your bags. We're going somewhere. Pack enough for two nights. She goes, where are we going? I go, you'll see. 
So she packs her bag. She's getting giddy and excited. She's putting all these things. We're putting the bags in the car. We head out of Cambridge and head up the 95. And we're, we're heading up north. And she goes, where are we going? Where are we going? Oh, I don't know. You'll see. Right? So it's all exciting. And she goes, oh, cool, cool. We must be going to the North Shore as we're driving up the 95 and heading to 128. Oh, we must be going to the North Shore. It's beautiful places like Rockport where you'd have these, uh, a rocky New England coast with these cute hotels on the side and a marina. I mean, it'd be this great place. So when we go going to Rockport, I go, you'll see, you'll see. And as we drive along, we pass the exit to Rockport and we keep going. And she keeps guessing different kinds of places where we might be. And I keep going, you'll see. And it's a super fun thing. When we cross the border into Maine, she doesn't know anything in Maine. <laughs> so at that point, then she stops guessing, and we're driving in the night. And then as we get to the destination, we drive off this t to this town called Kittery. And as we go off Kittery, the, it's, uh, we're driving up, and the, our tires, as we drive into the driveway of where we're going, our tires are crunching in the snow. And as we open the doors and she looks out, she gets to see a bed and breakfast that's blanketed in snow with a frozen pond next to it, also pristinely covered in snow. It's a clear night and the stars are sparkling and shining as if they're performing just for my wife. <laughs> and she looks at me and she looks at the bed and breakfast she looks at me, she looks at the bed and breakfast, and she starts to cry. And I go, yeah, got her. How awesome. But it doesn't stop there. We go in, we have the bed and breakfast, we, you know, spend the night, we wake up the next morning. <laughs> sure. God made it good, my friends, in the confines of marriage, if you want to go there. We wake up the next morning, and at the dinner table, at the breakfast table, so the guy, he actually works on Christmas Day. It was one of the few places I could find on Christmas. And here he is working on Christmas morning, and he's cooking up this incredible feast. He's, he's got this egg kind of frittata thing coming out of the oven. And this is what he does. This is ridiculous. He's got this iron cast skillet, and it's covered in butter. And what he's done is he's sliced Granny Smith apples, and he's put them on the plate. And they're sizzling away. And then he pours the pancake butter on top, batter on top of that and then puts little blueberries in there so they explode as they cook. And there we have in front of this, this, this culinary feast of egg frittata. And, and um, I've never had this before or since. Granny Smith apples sliced and covered in butter and griddled perfectly with these explosions of blueberry inside of them. And we're having this delectable breakfast in a bed and breakfast. And here comes my pièce de la résistance. I pull out an envelope and I say, open this. And she goes, what is it? And I go, you'll see. <laughs> and she opens it up and as she looks at it, what she sees is a certificate redeemable on this day. What I had done is that I've chosen a bed and breakfast next to the Kittery Outlet shopping malls. And what the certificate has said was that I will be her, her joyful companion, her shopping valet, for the entire day. And it listed out all the things that I would do as her shopping valet. Now, for those of you who know me, I hate shopping with a passion. I love the fact that Amazon exists today because I click and it's at my house. Thank you. That's redemption of some shopping. But shopping malls and going to them drive me crazy. I would be like, uh, you know, basically just put needles in my eyes instead of going shopping. This, oh, I hate it. But here I am. And in the shopping valley thing, I the, list out all the activities I would do. Like I would be by her side and never leave her in the mall. I will carry her bags the entire day. When she goes into the dressing room, when she comes out, I will thoughtfully give my feedback <laughs> and give all of the attention that she wants while we are doing these things, right? And so it lists out these things, and she looks at the certificate, and she looks at me, and she looks at the certificate, and she looks at me, and she starts to cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got her again. Now here's the question. 
I was pretty intentional about that day. We could have had a different kind of Christmas. We had our next door neighbors who were also in InterVarsity staff who were also stranded on Christmas Day uh, across the hall. We could have just done what's natural. We could have just gone with the flow, done something more organic, right? And what could we have done? Yeah, we probably would have woken up later that Christmas Day. She probably would have cooked because I'm not naturally a cook, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and she might have done the dishes because I don't naturally do the dishes either. <laughs> If we're just going with what's natural, right? And then on top of that, if we're just going along with what's natural, we probably would have knocked on our neighbor's doors and said, hey, you want to play Settlers of Catan? And we probably would have played like <laughs> six or seven hours of Catan until we were bleeding from our eyeballs and hating each other <laughs> for them trading with each other, you know what I'm saying? Um, and we would have had a fine day. It probably would have been a fun day. But the question is, what made my wife feel more loved? It was a day where I was intentional. See, sure, you can be intentional without love, and that's wrong. But you cannot be loving without being intentional. And in fact, if you're not intentional, I would ask, do you really love them at all? Just look at what you do. Look at what you plan. Those are things that happen because they are in line with the things that you currently love, not the things you say you love. And in fact, when you're with people you love, don't you think about them ahead of time and think about notes you might write or emails you might send or, or gifts you might give or ways that can help them feel special. Don't you do that with people you love? And with communities you love, wouldn't you go out of your way to march and protest alongside or just to listen, wouldn't you do things that would reflect the love you have for that community? If you're not intentional, I question whether you love that person at all. Because our intentionality is fruit of how much we love. And Jesus, in the deepest way, was deeply intentional because he deeply loved the Samaritan woman that he was going to meet. He intentionally walked into forbidden land, into the places where no other holy Israelite would go. Intentionally st stopped at a well to have a conversation with someone that no one would ever have from his culture, from his gender. And he intentionally takes these step, step after step after step to say how much he deeply loves her. And in the end, she gets it. And not only does she get that Jesus loves her, she understands that he's the Messiah. God himself loves her. And she gets a picture of what that means. And begins maybe with the faintest of hope, but starts to blossom in such a way that she can no longer deny that Jesus the Messiah has come. Where is your Samaria? Who are the people of your Samaria? And with whom do you need to take intentional steps with? And let me just take this a step further, since we're all talking about planting. In what ways, as you move forward to start something new, will you continue to be intentional with cynics, skeptics, and seekers so that they might know the love of God. Sure, I don't care if you love or love on them, right? Just love. Do what it takes. But uh, will you be intentional to show love so that they might know the love of God in their lives? As I mentioned, my Samaria back in college was my fraternity house. And it was the place that was desolate, the place as a Christian, like, nothing good happens in fraternity and sorority houses. Some of you might still think that. But there I was, knowing that if I was going to love them well, I needed to be intentional. So I did. And I did, like, stupid intentional stuff. So basically, I just asked my pastor. There was a Friday night Bible study that was happening at my church. And it was great. It was nourishing me. I was a pretty, like, newly committed Christian. But I asked my pastor hey, can I stop coming on Fridays so that I can reach out to my fraternity house? Would that be okay? And would you guys pray for me when I'm doing it? 
And I was totally, in some ways, like, ah, he's going to shoot this idea down. But to his credit, he blessed it. He said, no, do that. That is great. Gave me permission. And as he gave me permission, he had people praying, and then the university chapter came around me to pray. And so I would hang out in the fraternity house on Friday nights, and the time that I would have spent at Bible study, which is a bus ride, Bible study, and back. So we're talking from 7 to 10 o'clock. I promised that I was going to steer intentionally every single conversation to something spiritual, to something about God. I figured if you were in the fraternity house on a Friday night by yourself, you could use some company. So that was my intentionality. And that's how it just started. So at 7 o'clock, it hit. And I went, okay, this is my turn to be intentional, right? And I didn't do it just as a program. I did it because I loved these brothers. And so I would get, and the first guy I talked to, man, uh, we started talking. And my, I was loaded. We had no training for evangelism or planting or anything back then. This is like the early 90s. So I just sat down armed with one question, right? What's your spiritual background? And that's it. So I would sit down. Hey, what's your spiritual background? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, have you had any spiritual experiences? And he goes, oh, well, actually, yeah. And he started telling me this story about when this guy, he, he's Mexican, and he was driving in Mexico. And as he was on this road, he, he just... His car stopped in the middle of a road, he said, this dirt road with no lights, and he said that he swore he saw a demon on his car. And he goes, yeah, that's my spiritual experience. <laughs> okay, that's good. So I went on to the next guy, right? And, and that's how it went. It was like awkward. It was just me trying to gut it out, being intentional. And I did this every week. On Friday, on the fourth week, I'm talking to this guy, a, a guy named Gabe, another North Carolinian, tall, tar heel, not the guy who was Southern fried, but another guy. But this guy, um, you know, he, he was definitely, I mean, he, on weekends, you would never find him sober. His girlfriend was always over at the house. And as we were talking, I think before he was going out to party, I was saying, hey, man, do you have a spiritual background, right, my question? And he goes, uh, yeah, I used to be a Baptist. And I went, Baptist? No way! That's cool. I had no idea, right? Like, no, no way to know that he might have some Christian background at all. Baptist? Oh, so cool, man. So how come you don't go to church anymore? And he, you know, I'm just, like, energizing bunny, like, really talking like this. It was bad. How come you don't go to church anymore? <laughs> and he goes, um... Well, uh, you know, there's no Baptist churches around here. I go, actually, that's not true, man. There's a Baptist church over here. There's a Baptist church over there. I know there's a Baptist church over there. And if you want to go to a Korean Baptist church, there's one across the river. We could go there if you want to. Any Baptist church, I'll go with you on a Sunday. Do you want to go to a Baptist church? And he goes, I'm over there. And he stops me. He goes, James, James, it's just not convenient. Right? And I go, oh, well, what if church came to you? Like, and, you know, you say something. What if church came to you? And I see myself saying this, and I go, what the heck are you saying? <laughs> what if church came to you? <laughs> and he goes, well, as if he's echoing my thoughts, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, what if we studied the Bible here in this house every week? Would you come? He goes, I'd come to that. <laughs> that got me lit up. So then, intentionally, I went to every other brother in the house with a one-on-one -on -one conversation to ask them, well, hey, this guy's coming to Bible study. Do you want to go to Bible study? And <laughs> as it would roll, you know, roll, I would keep each name adding to the roster. Then I would say all their names to the next person, right? <laughs> a little sneaky, intentional, but out of love. <laughs> so then by the time we were done, a third of the house was signed up for the first fraternity Bible study. It's the beginnings. It was just steps of intentionality. And I got to say, like, if we're going out there with just our own cleverness and our own strategies, I don't I think we're doomed to, and destined to fail. Uh, but what we can trust is that what we're doing is in the Lord. And the Spirit has gone before us. And the Spirit is already at work around us. And even in the places where you see no witness at all, God is still on the move and still on the work. And how can we step into what he's doing? and take some intentional steps to follow Jesus so that others may know him.
Well, um, let's get back to the passage. Jesus enters his Samaria. He's talking to this woman. This woman starts to know that he's the Messiah. And let's pick up in verse 27. Then his disciples returned. They had gone away to get some food and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, right? Um, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. <laughs> now he's getting Yoda on them, right? <laughs> mm, food I have you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. And it's unclear whether he does this. You can imagine Jesus going, and look at the fields. And are they looking at the barley fields, which are white for harvest? Or are they looking at the crowd of Samaritans that are starting to come to this well? They are ripe for harvest. Even now, one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of the labor. What is Jesus doing with that speech? He's trying to help his disciples see what God is doing, and to turn them consistently toward those who are on the outside. See, these folks, his 12 Jewish men who are considered his students, have signed up to do the things the rabbi did for the reasons that he did them. That's what it meant to be a disciple. And they were thinking, are we going to start this new Israel? Are we going to do this thing, finally, where God is present? And Jesus consistently says, don't look within, look outside. Look at the harvest. It is ripe. Don't just be focused on what we're doing here. Keep lifting your eyes toward the harvest. And when we think about our plants, as we think about ourselves being intentional with people who aren't followers of Jesus yet, we should also, as we gather um, in our parlance, the pre-missional Christians and the missional Christians, when you start to gather the people who are starting to take risks to see this witnessing community come alive in your midst, make sure you keep doing what Jesus did and point their eyes to the harvest. It is no good if, you, if we send out ambitionaries to plant Christian clubs. It is no good to send out ambitionaries just to plant enclaves for Christians to be safe. It is not even good only just to send people out so they can gather and just do their own thing. That is not the point of what we're trying to do. And I know this from the top of the leaders of this organization to the bottom, that what we hope and press forward is what you would plant is something that would continue to lift its eyes toward the harvest. Keep planting not just communities, but witnessing communities. Don't settle for a group that is meeting just to pray for its own needs. Continue to think about how this group is going to lift up its eyes and keep seeking those outside the faith. It needs to keep happening. Dallas Willard, a mentor of mine, would say that people in this culture will judge the validity of a religion by the amount of blessing it brings to its outsiders. That this culture will judge the validity of our faith by the amount of blessing it brings to its outsiders. And in what ways it does us no good just to create another club, plant witnessing communities. But the thing is, once you start to plant, it's going to be there's a drift to low performance that continues all the time, right? It's another way to put that is vision leaks, as Bill Hybels would say, right? So you want it. You start talking about this missional community, this witnessing community that you want to plant on campus. You talk about the vision of reaching every campus corner, but then you start gathering people, and 
<laughs> we're all sinners, right? There's brokenness and things that happen that needs to be met. And all of a sudden, that mission doesn't feel as clear as it used to be. And you keep gathering the people together, and there are more needs to be met. And then you've got supervisors or coaches telling you, no, you got to get out of stage one. You need to start moving to the next stage. And there's this pressure to build something that feels secure and sustainable, something that we can tell our friends is happening here, something with momentum. And so you might start to drift and choose and make small decisions that keep you from planting the witnessing community. You gotta look for people who aren't just willing to take risks for the kingdom. If you wanna keep a community planting, uh, witnessing communities, you need to help them think about people who are willing to take risks with people who are not followers of Jesus. And I love how there are parts of our community already, I'm thinking about the central region, that just keeps defining that to say, like, don't settle for people just who want to take risks alone, but those who are willing to take risks with people on the outside. Keep pressing forward. Because, frankly, it's going to be the hardest thing to do. Just I look around, and almost everything we do in InterVarsity has some socially acceptable way to explain it. You know what I mean? We're helping people find meaning and purpose in their lives, discipleship. That's great. Glad you're doing that, right? We're seeking justice. We're seeking reconciliation. We're seeking to help bring people together while addressing the systemic issues of the day. People are like, that sounds great. Good job. Pat you on the back. That's awesome, right? All the stuff we do is so good. We're building communities so people have support so they can succeed in their lives in the way that God wants them to do. Oh, that's great, you know? You're doing a good job. Well, we want to talk about Jesus Christ, and he's the only way to Jesus, and the only way to God. And, ah, uh, wait a second. <laughs> That's not cool. All of a sudden, when you get to evangelism, and you start to want to talk about the things of Jesus and the exclusive claims he's making about being God, all of a sudden, that's not cool. So there are societal pressures and all kinds of pressures, and then our own even like temperament that will try to put evangelism at the back and say, well, hey, at least once we get about 30 or 40 people, then we'll talk about evangelism. Or once we get a community enough, then we'll start talking about that thing. But I'm telling you, what kinds of seeds are you planting with? What you plant with now will flourish in the future, and it'll be very difficult to turn the ship. It's possible. All things are possible in God. But as you plant, what seeds are you planting with? And will you infect these seeds with the DNA to love those outside of your walls? Please continue to keep people who don't know Jesus at your forefront. And I got to say, once you do that, the other values will come in, right? Because as you're preaching the gospel, you got to start living it out too. Oh my goodness, there's this gap of what I'm talking about in my life. And then all of a sudden, you're praying into things that you need to, like growing in faith and being more mature so I'm not a jerk when I'm sharing the faith. Or, right, you're reaching out to a community and clearly their concerns are breaking their hearts. And if you don't address the hurt and the pain in the community, and if you don't figure out how to address it directly, and how to come alongside and listen and to grieve and to partner, what kind of gospel do you have, right? So as you press into these other communities, it will force the other things to come to life in your community. But you can press into these other things and never do evangelism. See what I'm saying? Keep it at the forefront. All the stuff will come along because you'll be pressing into the cares and concerns of others. Well, with that, uh, starting in verse 39, so we've seen Jesus. He's intentional to love into this community. Then uh, he's turning his own disciples to keep their eyes open to the people who don't know, know him. Uh, now we're going to pick up at verse 39 and go to 42. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the women's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. 
Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Fantastic, right? So then she does this thing. And you'll find out, actually, I did a little bit of research of what happens to the Samaritan woman, right? Because she's clearly been a part of planting this witness, this community, this witnessing community in Samaria. She's actually known in the Orthodox Church as St. Fotini. Do you all know this? And St. Fotini then would lead, would continue to be a witness for Jesus. There's a discrepancy of what Fotini means. It's her baptism name. Um, and one translation has it as the enlightened one, and the other has it as equal to the apostles. So here's this woman who's going now in a culture that didn't have a lot of women preachers, right? And here she goes, and her whole family comes to know Jesus, uh, five sons, and she then goes around as a missionary. She makes it as far to um, modern-day Izmir, um, which would have been Smyrna back then in Turkey, and makes it as far as Carthage, modern-day Tunisia. So she's gone throughout the Mediterranean to talk about Jesus. She would die, according to tradition, she would die as a martyr um, at the hands of the emperor. All her five sons will die as martyrs, witnessing to Jesus. And her impact on the Mediterranean world has felt, has felt so much that she's revered in some traditions. She has left a legacy. And we know that from this passage. We know that a little bit from her tradition. And in these ways that as we seek to share these things that we hope and pray for a continued opening of what God will do to flourish and make these communities, witnessing communities, into a legacy. Um, so I told you about the times where uh, I was in this house. And so now we've got uh, 10 brothers sitting in a room. No one's a Christian, and we're studying the Bible together. Now, if you've ever studied the Bible in a room full of people who aren't Christian, it gets hilarious. It is amazing. It is the best because all of the preconceptions and the answers that you had had earlier, just, they're just gone. So here we are studying the Bible together, and uh, I'm just, I have, again, no training. I'm just going through Christian character Bible study, and we're going through, and they're throwing out, we're studying the, counting the, consider the cost as you build a tower. And the one guy goes, well, I think the tower represents pride. And that this pride is something, and he just goes on this other thing. And I'm like, well, okay, man, that's cool. What, what does the text say? Right? And that was the constant refrain. What does the Bible actually say? And so we would talk about those things. Now, um, about three weeks in, all the brothers came um, late. They're about 15 to 20 minutes late. Now... Just to give you a sense of how crappy a planter I was, what do you think, like, Christian planter did in that moment? Did he just smile, show a lot of grace for the, for the friends who've come late? Sure, come in, brother, move in high, move up higher, right? Like that kind of thing. Was that what happened? Um, as they strolled in, and when they finally came in, I shut the door. I looked at him, and I started getting red in the face. I was so angry. And then what came out of my mouth was just absolute drivel, right? Like, do I need this Bible study? Is this Bible study for me? I didn't do this Bible study for me. I know where I'm going when I die. Do you know where you go when you die? I'm not doing this for me. So, hey, if we can't be here on time, let's just not do this at all. Let's open up the Bible. <laughs> Their eyes are just huge, stunned, absolutely stunned. Next week, rang the bell, everyone was on time. <laughs> no one dropped out, but it's totally messed up, right? Absolutely messed up. Don't ever do what I just did. <laughs> but just to say how messed up I was in doing these things. And then when it came to the point where, like, for three months in, we're nearing the end of the semester, I was like, well, I should ask. How do you do this? Now, I grew up in a Korean Presbyterian church, so I'm going to do what the Koreans did. Okay, guys, can everyone bow their heads? And we just went to it, right? We just went for it. I had them bow their And I even said stuff like this. You know, right now, some of you want to start following Jesus with your entire life. Right now, you might start feeling your heart thumping, right? I just went through that whole, <laughs> you might sense something going on. Uh, and it's funny, as my friend tells it, um, Danny, he said right when I said that, he, it was exactly what was happening in his heart. His heart was thumping. And I asked him to raise their hands, that it was something between you and God. And Danny starts to raise his hand. He becomes the first believer in Phi Kappa Theta. 
he starts leading other people to faith in Phi Gamma Theta. Other people join us in the mission. By the time I'm a senior, the house is a third Christian. Our reputation on the campus was that we were the Christian nice guy house, not our reputation four years ago. Actually, we had no reputation because people didn't know who we were. But now, <laughs> they did. We were the Christian nice guy house. It has continued. That Bible study has continued for the last 22 years. It is still going on. And people have come out of there becoming missionaries, becoming leaders in the, in the business and in the church. And they've come out and there's a constant, there are people who've come on staff out of that Bible study. There are people that just from that Bible study continue to grow and flourish. Now, get this. That first person who came to know Jesus is a good friend of mine, godfather to my second son. And he then after college became a missionary uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts, to Cambodians, and then he became a missionary to the urban poor in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Now he's back doing his PhD in, uh, um, uh, in uh, what's it called? The study of diseases. I forget what that's called. Exactly. <laughs> and then he went to China because of that study, um, and in China led more people to faith, <laughs> right? Then he's come back. Now, Two years ago, I invite Danny to come with me to speak at Greek Conference Indianapolis. And we were back there in, in February. It was so fun to be teaching with my friend. And I was sharing my side of the Bible study story. And then he was sharing his side of what it felt like to him, which was I had never heard some of the stories coming out of his mouth before, <laughs> which was hysterical. And then we together, along with the entire leadership of the Greek community that was there, invited people to start or lead uh, witnessing communities in their houses. And 315 people committed to starting or leading uh, witnessing communities in their fraternities and sororities, as well as the 53 people who came to faith that weekend. Can you just imagine the multiplicative impact of what's happening based on one intentional decision 22 years ago? And then now it's come to this point to the present where there's 315 others doing what we were hoping to do, what we had done, and to continue to see the spiraling of others who are coming to faith and planting and other people coming to faith and planting. And we don't have plans for that. There's no 20-year strategy in InterVarsity for planting. We're just hoping you graduate from college. <laughs> but God has a plan for all of it. God has a plan for Jesus when he meets a woman at the well to see that blessed the Mediterranean. God had a plan for me and my friend Danny as we we're planting in Phi Kappa Theta to bless Greeks throughout the country. And God has a plan for the things that you're doing. As long as you keep your eyes to the skeptic, the seeker, and the cynic, as long as you keep helping your Christians turn to being intentional to people who are outside of your walls, can you imagine what God might do with your faithfulness in the present. And if you can, then I think God can blow that out of the water. I say all that just to say that God does these cool things. But now I'm just going to say, forget the dreams. Be faithful. You have no idea. I had no idea. I always tell my friends, you know, I cannot outdream what God's going to do with me five years from now. Of my best thinking of what I'll do in five years, God outdreams me. And what reality is is so much bigger and greater. With you in this time, can you be faithful to those who don't know Jesus around you? And as you plant, to keep them in mind. And as you do, I pray that the Spirit will take your faithfulness and make it 30, 60, and 100-fold. Let's pray.